there's a very simple proof that the number e is irrational. And that's what I'd like to show you today. Now, we first need to decide, though, what's the definition of e that we're going to use? Because really, there's a couple of possibilities. One possible definition, and this is the most common, is that e is the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the n. And when I first show this to my students, I have them plug in a large number for n into this expression here. So like n equals 1,000. And in that case, you'd get 1.001 .001 raised to the thousandth power. And I've written that out here. It's really 1.001 .001 times 1.001 .001 and so on, with a total of 1,000 factors. Now, it's not at all clear whether you should expect your final answer to be a really, really large number, because we have a very large exponent right here, or maybe should we expect the number to still be pretty close to 1, because all these factors themselves are all very close to 1. And it turns out that neither of those really ends up happening. Here's the expression for various values of n. So for n equals 1,000, we have 2.71692. And notice as this n gets larger and larger and larger, these numbers turn out to be getting closer and closer to some particular number that's about 2.718. And that's how we define e. It's the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the n. But there's another definition of e, and this is the one that we'll be using in our proof, that says that e is the sum of the reciprocals of the factorials. So remember that 0 factorial is just 1. So we can think of this as 1 over 0 factorial plus 1 over 1 factorial plus 1 over 2 factorial, and so on. And this series converges quite rapidly to e. The factorials grow large very fast. 10 factorial, for example, is already in the millions. I think it's like over 3 million. And even just adding the first few terms here, so let's say the first three terms, we're already at 2.5, which is pretty close to e. Now, it's definitely not obvious, though, that these two definitions are equivalent, that they define the same number. There's a way you can show it by expanding this 1 plus 1 over n to the nth power using the binomial theorem. It takes a little bit of work, and there's a convergence issue that you have to think about. But usually where this second definition of e is first encountered would typically be in a calculus class where you're going over power series. So here's the power series for e to the x. And if you've never seen power series before, in the final part of this video, I'll give a little visual demonstration of this series. But notice what happens when you let x be 1. Well, we really get our definition of e. e to the 1, or just e, is 1 plus 1 plus 1 over 2 factorial plus 1 over 3 factorial, and so on. Okay, so how can we show that e is irrational? Well, we're going to do a proof by contradiction. So we're going to suppose that e is rational. So we'll assume that e can be written in this form a over b, where a and b are positive integers. And we're going to show that this assumption will lead to a contradiction. So this is called a proof by contradiction. We assume the opposite of the thing that we're trying to prove, and we show that this leads to some kind of absurdity, something that can't possibly be true. So we assume e can be written in this form, a over b. So a over b, then, is the sum of the reciprocals of the factorials. And what we're going to do is, first of all, we'd like to clear out some of these fractions. So how can we do that? Well, we have a b in the denominator here. It might be nice to multiply both sides by b. But we're actually going to do more than just b. We want to clear out some of these factorials as well. So we're going to multiply both sides by b factorial. Now, notice in the denominator here, we have 0 factorial, 1 factorial, 2 factorial. Eventually, it's going to get up to a b factorial and then a b plus 1 factorial. So I've written it right here like this. We're going to separate the right-hand side into the part that's up to the b factorial term and then the part that's beyond the b factorial. And we're going to take both sides of this equation and multiply by b factorial. Now, when we take the left-hand side and multiply it by b factorial, well, what's b factorial over b? Isn't it just b minus 1 factorial? So think, for example, what's 7 factorial divided by 7? Well, the 7s would just chop out, and you'd have a 6 factorial. Now, on the right-hand side, we'll take each of these two things and multiply by b factorial. So we'll distribute the b factorials, and in this first part, when we do that, we get a bunch of terms that are of the form a factorial divided by a smaller factorial. Well, a factorial divided by a smaller factorial will always be an integer. Think, for example, what is 7 factorial divided by 4 factorial? Well, it would just be 7 times 6 times 5, right, which is an integer. So the point is each of these terms in here is an integer. So when we sum them up, we get one big integer here. So notice what we have here is an integer equals an integer plus 
Well, what we're going to show is that this is, well, first of all, it's positive, but we're going to show it's less than one. So it won't be an integer. So that will be our contradiction. We'll have this integer equals this integer plus something that's between zero and one, strictly between zero and one. So it's not an integer. So that will be our contradiction. So the one thing we have left to show is that this is less than one. Okay, so our goal is to show that this is less than one no matter what our positive integer b is. But sometimes it's helpful to be a little bit concrete. And so we're gonna imagine for the moment anyway that b is seven and see what happens. Well, if we let b be seven, notice we get seven factorial over eight factorial plus seven factorial over nine factorial plus seven factorial over 10 factorial and so on. And how do these simplify? Well, seven factorial over eight factorial is just one eighth. Just think of what seven factorial and eight factorial mean. And then 7 factorial over 9 factorial simplifies to be this, and then 7 factorial over 10 factorial is this. And we want to show that this series sums up to something less than 1. And we do that by comparing it with a larger series. Notice that 8 times 9, of course, is bigger than 8 times 8, but this is in the denominator of a fraction, so this fraction is smaller than this fraction. And same thing here, this is smaller than this, so this series sums to be something that's less than what this series sums to be. But notice this is just a geometric series. It's really 1 8 plus 1 8 squared plus 1 8 cubed and so on. And geometric series are nice because we can say what the series converges to, if it does converge. And this one converges to 1 7th. Now, I'll explain that in a second, but just take my word for it right now. This series converges to 1 7th, which is less than 1. Okay, so when b was 7, this ended up being less than 1 7th. Now, for a general value of b, we can do the same thing. We want to show this is less than 1, so I've rewritten it right here. But notice b factorial over b plus 1 factorial is just 1 over b plus 1. This will be 1 over b plus 1 times b plus 2. This is this, and so on. And again, b plus 2 is greater than b plus 1, so this fraction is smaller than this fraction, 1 over b plus 1 times b plus 1. And do the same thing here for all of these. And this is a geometric series which sums up to 1 over b. And I'll explain why it's 1 over b in a second, but since b is a positive integer, 1 over b is less than or equal to 1, so our original series is strictly less than 1. So this gives us our contradiction. Assuming that e could be written in this form a over b, we have an integer equals another integer plus a number that's not an integer, a number that's strictly between 0 and 1. So that's a nice little proof that e is irrational, that it can't be written in this form a over b. Now, the one thing I didn't show was about geometric series. How do we know that this series sums up to 1 over b? So here's the standard formula for geometric series. And I know many of you have seen this before, but maybe you don't know where it comes from or how you could explain it to someone real quickly. So imagine you're trying to multiply out 1 minus x times 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus x to the fourth. And I'll stop at x to the fourth. Well, you can do that by first multiplying 1 by each of these terms and then minus x by each of these terms. So when we do 1 times this, we get this. And we do minus x times this, we get this. But notice that we get some nice simplification. Basically, everything cancels out except the first term and the last term. This simplifies to just 1 minus x to the fifth. And in general, if we did 1 minus x times 1 plus x plus x squared, and we stopped at x to the n, so instead of stopping at x to the fourth, we stop at x to the n, we get 1 minus x to the n plus 1. And then if we take this equation and divide both sides by 1 minus x, we get this. And if you wanted to, you could prove this rigorously using induction. But notice what happens when we let n approach infinity. Well, the left-hand side becomes this series, this infinite series. And the right-hand side, well, if x is bigger than 1, this is just going to blow up as n goes to infinity. But if x is between minus 1 and 1, this will go to 0. And we just end up with this. So that's where our formula comes from. But notice that if we multiply both sides of this equation by x, we get this on the left side and this on the right side. And this is the form that we're going to need it in for our series.
So notice we get some great formulas here. If we let x be 1 half, we get 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth plus 1 sixteenth and so on. It sums up to be 1. Or 1 third plus 1 ninth plus 1 over 27 plus 1 over 81. That sums up to be a half. In fact, try that on a calculator. Do 1 third plus 1 ninth plus 1 over 27 and so forth. And it's going to get closer and closer to 0.5. And for our series, we had 1 over b plus 1 plus 1 over b plus 1 squared and so on. If you plug it in, you end up getting 1 over b. So that's why that series sums to 1 over b. And finally, I mentioned that I would give a little visual demonstration of the power series for e to the x. So here's the graph of e to the x. If we wanted to do a linear approximation of this function at x equals 0, the line of best fit, the tangent line, would be y equals 1 plus x. The best quadratic approximation would be 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 or over 2 factorial. The best cubic approximation would be this. And the way you find these approximations, by the way, is by doing calculus. You find the polynomial whose derivatives all agree with the derivatives of e to the x at x equals 0 up to the order of the degree of the polynomial. And the amazing thing is that if we keep going up, our polynomial approximations start looking more and more like e to the x not only near x equals 0, where we might expect them to because we're approximating at x equals 0, but far away from x equals 0 as well. In fact, if we add infinitely many terms, our approximation becomes exact. It's exactly equal to e to the x for all values of x on the entire real line. So that's really an amazing property of the function e to the x that it is what's called an analytic function. Well, thank you for watching. I have another video on the proof that pi is irrational. That proof is a bit more challenging, but I gave what I think is the simplest proof. And the link is on the end screen here.